honest questions with honest answers. This is Unfiltered, brought to you by the Emergency Medical Minute. We're fortunate to have on the podcast today, Russell Lede, um, long distinguished list of accomplishments um, and a fascinating background. He's He has his PhD in molecular oncology from New York University, and he's currently enrolled in the MD MBA program at Tulane. Um, he's the co-founder of an organization called the 15 White Coats, which is focused on helping people of color get into medical school and improving the cultural lit- literacy of our learning spaces. Um, Russell is a, uh, a U.S. Navy veteran. He was a cryptologic technician and a first-class petty officer uh, with numerous awards. He's traveled the world. He's a proud veteran. He's an alum of Southern University and a and College with a B.S. in chemistry and a B.S. in biology. He's a member of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity, uh, and then he went on to get his Ph.D. from NYU. Uh, he's a fascinating story. Uh, he's a he's a passionate, inspirational individual, and uh, we're we're fortunate to have him on the podcast today. So, good morning, and welcome back to Unfiltered. We are privileged to have Russell Lede with us here today. Uh, he is a second year medical student at Tulane, uh, but that's just the most recent of his extensive and impressive accomplishments thus far. I'm really excited to have you on, Russell. Uh, would you start just kind of by introducing yourself and we'll we'll get down into it? Yeah, so my name is Russell Lede. Uh, as was just mentioned, uh, I'm a, a rising third year medical student at Tulane University School of Medicine. I'm also uh, an MBA student at the Freeman School of Business at Tulane. Um, and I'm really excited to be on Unfiltered today. I think this is going to be amazing. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. It, and it will be because of the guest, uh, more so than because of the host. But, uh, but I, I, you know, one of my, one of my favorite parts about hosting this podcast is to hear people's origin stories. And we have a ton of content I'd like to get through, but none of it kind of more important than where you came from. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, uh, your, your background, uh, how you initially, uh, learned about medicine, how you learned that you could be a physician. Uh, just kind of take me through uh, what uh, what your origin story is, Russell. Yeah, man. So I, I grew up in um, a small town um, in southwest Louisiana called Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, and I grew up in a little uh, neighborhood called Car Shop. And I, and I talk about Car Shop because um, you can kind of Google Car Shop and, and get a sense of what that neighborhood was like. It was kind of like um, it was a little bit like being deployed to the Middle East, um, in some ways. And I, and I can say that because I've been deployed enough times to know. Um, and, uh, you know, I grew up there with my mom. Uh, she was a single mom. She raised uh, myself and, uh, and my sister, who's three years younger than me. Um, you know, single mom trying to raise two kids, uh, her and my dad, uh, they, I don't think they ever really got off on a good foot. Um, and then my sister's dad never really got off on a good foot with my mom either. Um, and so my mom just kind of figured it out on her own, man. Um, you know, she raised us in the same house until we were, until I was about 16, um, on 8th Avenue. And I I bring that up because a little bit later I'll mention something that really stuck with me and kind of got me to where I am now. Um, and so we, you know, we were raised there. My mom never really could, you know, when I look back on it, I don't think she could really establish her own identity. She spent the majority of her life trying to provide for us. She was a certified nurse's aide um, at the time, making minimum wage, um, doing a minimum, I mean, doing doing a, the maximum she could with what she had. Um, and there's some vivid stories that I, I kind of always rely on um, to keep me grounded in what I'm doing and why I'm doing it um, and not put myself on this pedestal. And one of them is, uh, I remember as a kid, um, my mom would give to my grandmother, um, who couldn't read. My grandmother couldn't read. She just spoke a lot of broken Cajun French, um, and a little bit of English, but she couldn't read. Um, but she was very wise. Um, and so my mom would take the money that she would get, um, from her paycheck and give it to my grandmother, um, to save up enough money for the rent. But I could always remember my mom visiting my grandmother and, um, going over there and counting that same money that she gave her over and over and over, knowing that it wasn't enough. 
Um, and I used to always wonder, like, why, why are you counting money um, when you know it's not enough? Like, you, it's not enough. It's not going to change just because it's under the mattress. Um, and she used to be like, you know, I'm just, I'm just holding out hope to that is hopefully enough. And then I remember her going to the rent um, company uh, and, and 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 hoping to God that they would take what she had. Um, and, and many times they did. And I, and I can honestly say um, Owens and Associates was a company that really uh, gave us a lot of leniency on our rent when I was growing up. And I can remember that because um, they would give us a, a, a pretty good deal, um, even though my mom rarely had enough money all the time to pay for our rent. And, and I keep those things in mind because um, it reminds me that you – you, there are people who are still in those situations right now, and you had better use the platform you have to make a difference and uh, try to pull some people up out of that. Because um, everybody's not going to have the luck that I had. I, I think a lot of things that happened for me were luck. A lot of things that happened for me were just, you know, with some blessings that just rolled my way. Um, but that doesn't happen for everyone. So somebody's got to be conscientious enough to make a difference for those kids. Absolutely. I, you know, you can hear in your voice, Russell, you know, you can tell when people will never forget who they are, or where they came from. Uh, yeah. And you can, you can hear that in your voice. Tell me more about how that plays into, plays into your journey. I mean, how have you leaned on those experiences as, as you've, uh, and we haven't even begun to discuss uh, all of the incredible things you've done so far, but just tell me more about how you've leaned on those experiences to make you the person that you are and how that has driven you to your career as a veteran, to your uh, PhD in molecular oncology. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, man. So I think um, those kinds of experiences, I think watching my mom, I think one thing when I think about it is um, when I was a kid, right, um, my mom and dad had sort of like this animosity relationship. And in hindsight, um, I could see how I created a lot of friction between me and any male leader that I ever had over me. When I was in the military, I always had an issue with male leaders um, being over me. Um, but female leaders could, for some reason, they could they could corral me, they could you know lead and guide me. And it took me a long time to understand psychologically what was happening. Um, but I also bring that up that that dichotomy because when I was a kid, um, I used to just. I don't know why, but for some reason, I used to look for role models. Um, I used to look for people who I thought just knew more than what I was normally hearing, you know. And so I had an uncle. Um, his name was uh, Jerry. Uh, he he worked in um, at, at the time he was working at this place called Montana's um, Smokehouse in Lake Charles, and he gave me my first job at 15 years old. Um, he let me come there and wash dishes, and he used to just tell me how the world works, like, and specifically how the world works for a black man. Cause it's, you know, many, a lot of people don't like to acknowledge this, but I, I'm, I'm pretty candid about it, that I, I'm pretty convinced that sometimes we live in different worlds. Um, different folks live in different worlds and the way that sometimes you perceive or the way that you have to operate is just different. And he used to explain to me how to, how to move and shake in this world. And then also um, one thing that really motivated me was, one of my best friends, um, I never forget when I was growing up, me, Mike, and Demo, um, we all grew up on the same street um, on 8th Avenue in Car Shop. Um, and we came up with this idea that we were going to sell snow cones to kids in the neighborhood. So Mike had this uh, snow cone machine um, in his garage. And we just, we bought a block of ice and we started shaving out snow cones. We made some flavors. We started selling it. And one day, Mike's dad came outside. Um, he was a truck driver at the time, and um, he had just come back. He sat us down in the garage, and he was explaining to us what we were doing and how it was so important for us to start to understand entrepreneurship at a young age. But he also started, um, he kind of was speaking over our life, man. Like, he was just sitting there and telling us, like, what he was seeing in us, you know, how he could see what our future would kind of look like just based on the persona we carried, you know, and he was talking to me specifically and he was like yo like listen you are a relentless child he was like you don't <laughs> give up on anything he was like you just he was like i don't know what it is he was like but you're gonna be successful he's like i don't know 
why I'm saying this or, or how do I know this? He was like, but you're going to be successful. And it's crazy because I never forgot what he told me. I like held on to it. I, I Like everywhere I would go, I'd be like, Yo, I believe what Mr. Mike told me. Um, I just believed it. And I operated accordingly. You know, if I was sitting in the classroom, I just believed that I was smart. And, and I also would act as if I was smart. You know, I would read um, with the mindset of somebody who was supposed to understand what was going on. Um, I was relentless and just learning. And also my mom was very adamant about me reading. I remember her, I told you she was a CNA and she used to work at this, uh, she used to work at this, uh, this old folks home, um, or, you know, residential home for the, the more, uh, proper term. And she used to get the books, um, from the older ladies there. And she used to tell them like, you know, when y'all finish a book, please give it to me. So my sons can have a book to read. So my son can have a book to read. Um, and I didn't love reading. I'll be candid at the time. I didn't love reading. Um, but my mom would demand that if I didn't read, um, I couldn't go outside and play. Um, I couldn't go outside and hang out with my homies. We couldn't go, you know, run the streets and chase dogs and ride our bikes and do whatever. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'm just going to read whatever it is, what it is. And I ended up reading things like, you know, the great Gatsby and all these books that to be candid with you, like the hood I come from, you just don't read them. I mean, they can't, I mean, we don't read anything outside of sports magazines. So at the time, at least, um, this was back in the early nineties, um, in, in late nineties. Um, but my mom had me reading, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird and The Bluest Eye uh, by Toni Morrison. She just had me reading, reading, reading. And of course, my friends didn't know about it. Um, but she was giving me my first exposure to quality education. And she was also giving me an opportunity to explore a world that I probably would never get to see as a child. That caused curiosity. That caused me to you know, question so many things. It definitely gave me the curiosity to be a scientist. I, I questioned so many things. Like why, I remember sitting on my porch um, in these blue plastic chairs and wondering why would the leaves fall off the tree green and then a few days would be brown. And I'm like, what's making them change? Like, you know, nobody's going out there and painting the leaves. <laughs> um, and it's crazy how now I realize like there were kids who knew the answer to that as kids. Like they weren't questioning it because somebody was teaching it to them. Um, and I was just sitting outside being curious, you know, like getting seeds out of the watermelon and then planting them in the backyard right by the uh, water spigot. And hopefully some of the water would drip out and the, the plant would grow, you know, but then the, the you know, and then I had to go outside and cut the grass, forget it was there and cutting it, but realizing like it's going to grow back. It's crazy how all these little things that I think back when I was a kid, they made me curious, you know, but you don't, I think where I was growing up, how I grew up, you can't, one, you can't express those things. You can't be like, yo, I'm really curious about these things that we probably not going to get an opportunity to, to see, you know, like, what is it like to live in Germany? What is it like to live in Zimbabwe? Where is Madagascar? You know, I remember when we got AOL dollar. I would like go and find a map and then look for these obscure islands like in the middle of the Indian Ocean that people even today like don't even know about. You know, I remember arguing with some of my friends in my during my PhD and be like, yo, you know they have islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean that are like remote. <laughs> and they were like, No, that's not true. I'm like, look, let's go look it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's crazy, you know, because I was thinking about that as a young kid, man, like, yo, this it's just this this world is way bigger than Lake Charles. But also realizing, like, I live in Lake Charles, and this is where we are. This is where I'm at. This is all I know, you know. So when I got an opportunity to leave, um, and my mom and I had a rocky relationship as I got ready to leave for the military, mainly because um, I had committed my life to Jesus Christ. I was dating um, my now wife um, of close to 15 years, but at the time we were in high school. Um, and I, I was really being drawn to my, you know, to my faith. And my mom at the time, she had got into a precarious situation where she wasn't really making as much money, but they had raised the rent. And so she was dating this guy um, who she had dated before. But in the South, we had this term called sugar daddy. Um, <laughs> and I'm candid about these things because I think unless you tell the true story, like some kids don't like somebody going to listen to this podcast and be like, yo, I've been through that before. Or, That's oh, right. I'm going through that right now. So I'm just going to be honest. And my mom knows it. We had this conversation and she she acknowledges that like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have did that. But the guy was married 
And um, and obviously with my faith, I was like, oh, I can't ride with this. Like, I can't rock with this. This just ain't right. Plus, he wasn't really treating me and my sister right. He wasn't really flying with the fact that, you know, I was a young man in his house. He was like, it's only one man in my house and that's going to be me. And, mm-hmm. You know, so it, it made for a rocky situation as I was graduating high school and kind of made it precarious as to where I could sleep at night, um, um, which was rarely there where they were living. So that we moved out of the house we had been in since I was a kid. Um, and by we, I really, you know, my mom and my sister, cause I was just kind of sometimes sleeping at my best friend's house, my, my grandmother's house every once in a while I would sneak back over there, but I really couldn't, you know, stay there, but I did make good grades and I did get a chance to take my ASVAB and, um, that just changed the game for me. I scored really well. I always did well in school. Um, although, you know, it was just always a weird situation. Um, just with trying to figure out what was a stable lifestyle for a high school student, you know, but I did really well, got to take the ASVAB, did really well, got put into intelligence. Um, but before I could actually go to intelligence school, I got selected to be in the United States Naval Ceremonial Guard in Washington, D.C., um, usually the people in the pristine uniforms you see on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really changed the game for me because now I could layer on top of what Mr. Mike had told me um this exposure to these amazing people who had accomplished so much. This is the first time I was around real important people. I mean the most important person I had ever been around when I was a kid was one time my uncle was working at Montana, the next to that Montana smokehouse was a a, a hotel and Scotty Pippen <laughs> and um Tracy McGrady were in that hotel and he found out because they came to eat at Montana's and he was like, yo, we just going to stand outside and we're going to see them. And then they saw us, waved us off and kept it pushing. And the only other time I was ever around somebody important was the priest in the Catholic Church. That was the only two times that I was ever around anybody. And, and by priest in the Catholic Church, I mean, they only important to the people who part of their parish. If, if, if The normal person in the story wouldn't even bat an eye at them. So, you know, other than that, but then I go out there, I'm like around heads of state and, you know, the president. And all these other people. And it's just like, yo, hold on. I can have conversations with these people. And of course, you know, you sit down and break down. You ask them, like, how did you become successful? Mm -hmm. And they like, don't ask for permission. Just ask for forgiveness. You could do whatever you want. It's like, no, nobody ever told you that before. I'm like, nah. They're like, what do you mean you can do anything you want? It's like, put your mind to it and go do it. And that's kind of how I've been living my life ever since, man. And it's been a been a ride. <laughs> Russell, I think everything has come full circle. I mean, <laughs> Scotty Pippen is getting a lot of publicity with this The Last Dance documentary coming out, but I mean, you've been on CNN and <laughs> ABC and Kelly Clarkson and Ellen. I, I mean, you're, I think you're going to supersede Scotty Pippen soon. Enough. I might, I might, <laughs> I might. It's, I got a possibility, bro. I got a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be lucky to be standing outside waiting for you. Yeah. Before you know yeah. it. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so, man. I hope so. I appreciate that. I think it's such a powerful testimony to the value of a, of a mentor, you know, the value of somebody who tells you that your possibilities are limitless and the value of people sacrificing for you and, you know, actively, despite, you know, your mom working hard every single day, despite that, you know, taking the time and the commitment to expand your horizons, particularly through reading. I think that's a, that's a powerful testament. And, uh, and I think that, I'm hopeful that a lot of our listeners that listen to that can identify with that. And, yeah. um, and I know that's something that's, um, that's important to you that, that when people hear this, they identify with some of the aspects of, of what you went through growing up and understand that they're not alone. They're not the only person to go through that. And that there is, you know, there's this world of possibility out there to your point. There are islands in the middle of the Indian ocean that, uh, nobody's <laughs> ever heard of, but that, yeah. uh, if you wanted to go to today, you could go to them. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I appreciate your, your candid recollection of that. And I, I appreciate your sharing that experience because it's clearly made such a, such a big component of who you are. Um, you know, being a veteran, um, is, is a big part of your story too. And the first step that, you know, it sounds like being in DC, being surrounded by those types of folks, definitely continue to expand your horizon. Can you touch on, what the rest of your service meant to you uh, uh, during your during your time as a uh, as a cryptogenic technician, a code breaker. Uh, tell me tell me more about that and how that influenced and 
help mold you into who you are today? Yeah, man. So um, I think at every stage of my military time, there was someone that I could point to and be like, yo, had it not been for like, you know, those folks, I'd probably be, to be candid, I'd probably be dead. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead. But I'm here. Um, when I was in Washington, D.C., it was um, Kerner and Michelle Long who were, uh, I don't know why, but when I was in in, in Washington, D.C., um, I was young. I was clubbing a lot. I was getting my work done. I was very successful at getting my work done. Um, but I was clubbing a lot. But I was still always waking up on Sunday morning and going to church. And that's crazy because, like, I would be wasted. I mean, like, in a in like a crazy way, you know, you just party hard, you work hard, Monday through Friday, Saturday come, you like, yo, we turning up. And then yep. Sunday morning, somehow I would drag myself out and go to church. And the reason why I bring that up is because there was this couple there, older couple, uh, Kerner and, Mike and uh, Michelle Long, and they pulled me to the side one day after church and were like, yo, you coming to our house. It's like, you coming to our house, you going to have dinner with us. And you're going to be our son while you're out here. You will be our son. We're going to take care of you. We're going to try to help you understand who you are, how, you know, how to navigate this world. Because this is your first time being on your own, away from home. And it looks like you don't know how to handle it. And they definitely helped me a lot. I, I used to, I remember sitting down and watching Kerner, who had three girls. He had three daughters. I remember watching him be a father. I also remember watching him like from a distance, staring and watching him be a husband. And that was the first exposure I had to a husband. I was like 19, 20 years old. It was the first time I was ever around a husband, ever. Um, none of my aunts um, had gotten, my aunt and my mom never got married. Um, and my grandmother had never, she didn't um, get married again because my grandfather, when he passed away, left her a check. And if she would have got married again, she would have lost that check. So she decided that the person who I, I look up to as my grandfather couldn't marry my grandmother because then she would have lost the money. So I never really saw a real marriage happen. But I was sitting in this house like watching this happen. And these were things that I was aspiring to because I don't know if you know, but like when you get into the military, you have your hometown girl, you know, you want to go back and get her, you know, and, and you know, or or him, you know, whoever uh, you, you, you date, whether it's a, you know, heterosexual or homosexual relationship or whatever, um, you want to go back and get that person. You long for that person because you're away from home and you want a taste of home. You want a, 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 a you know, some sort of um, reminiscence of home. And so I wanted my wife. I wanted my girlfriend at the time to be my wife. And um, but I didn't know how to be a husband. I had never seen a husband before. Um and I was able to watch him be a husband. Um, and I also was able to watch him be a dad to three girls. And I didn't know at the time that I would end up being the father of two girls. Um, and so it was crazy how I was able to witness this long before I got married. Um, and so for kind of like my first year in the military, they, they really took care of me. They, they would pray for me. They would make sure that I didn't. I remember some precarious situations that I probably could have got myself into that they took my keys and were like, no, you're staying here. And in the morning, you could go to work. But tonight, you're not going. So, you know, you just going to sleep in the basement. And in the morning, watch as many movies as you want, play the video games, but you're not leaving. Mm -hmm. um, How did you they, handle they, that when they did that? I mean, right. I just took it, man. Yeah. Because I knew they had good intentions. And I was already, I was outside of my element. You know, when you when you in, when you in your hood, you could do whatever you you know how you know how the rules of the game work in your hood. When you in Washington D.C., you don't know how it works. You think you do, but it's you could find yourself in some very dangerous situations and you don't know it. So I had to trust what they knew, you know. Um, and it took some while for them to gain my trust, but once once they got it, it was over. And I mean, I was recently there um, speaking on Capitol Hill, um, and. I stayed at their house and like, you know, their daughters are like my siblings. Um, and so it's, it, it was, it was, it took a while, but once I got it, it was, you know, when I look back on it, that was a blessing. Like I couldn't, I could never repay them for what they did for me. And the other person was Master Chief Carolina who uh, 
he was his master chief at the command I was at the United States Naval Sea Cadet. I mean, United States Naval Ceremonial Guard. And he would, uh, he just was stern, man. Like he was always stern on me, like more stern than everybody else. But he used to always tell me like, I just believe you're going to be somebody important. And so I can't let you, I can't let up on letting, uh, you know, on letting you do what you want. So I'm going to be harder on you and you just going to live with it. And of course I was in the military and he was a master chief, which is like the highest enlisted ranking. Mm -hmm. So, I I mean, he kind of was, you know, he had to double whammy. I really couldn't do anything. (laughs) Um, Plus he was from the South, large, like tall, like six foot nine um, um, guy, but he was just, he was a monster, but he was, you know, a gentle giant. And so those two people, when I was in DC, were those two groups of people were like critical. And then when I moved to, um, Pensacola for my training. Um, that was the, that actually was the period where I got to know my wife. I got married when I was in DC, but my wife and I were alone. It was just us two when I was in cryptology school, um, in Pensacola. Um, and that was the rockiest moment. My wife and I always laugh and joke about how it was the rockiest part of our relationship because, um, we were just young, but she became my champion. Because she she used to tell me, like, you know, I'm never surprised when you succeed. I'm only surprised when you fail. And I just hung on to those words. You know, when she would be like, listen, you're going to school. I know this is tough. You got to learn more than you ever learned in your life, but you can do it. You know, and I would come home boohooing and crying about all this material we had to learn and how we couldn't bring it home because obviously it was, it was secret material. Um, you know, and she, she was just a champion, man. I remember her working at Charlotte Roos. Um, and she, she was, uh, she wanted to be in college at the time, but she was like, nah, we need this money right now. So I'm going to stop this college thing and I'm going to go to work. And now I look back on it. I'm like, man, like she made some legit sacrifices to make sure that I succeeded, um, at the time. And then in DC, I mean, and then I moved to, uh, Jacksonville. Um, and that was my last on base, I mean, um, on us soil duty station. Um, in uh, Mayport, Florida, aboard the USS John L. Hall, which was a frigate, a small boat. Um, and there were like so many, man, I could name off so many people, but Tim Pavey, um, you know, Derek Simmons, Chief, Chief Derek Simmons, um, Renwick. There's like so many people, bro. Richard Engel. Oh, Richard Engel, bro. He was the first person to tell me I could go to college. He was the first person who told me I was smart enough to go to college ever in my life. You were I remember 20, going 20, to my, 21 years old at that point. I, 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 yeah, I was like 21 or 22. He's the first person to tell me, yo, if you go to college, you'll run circles around people. And it's crazy because when my 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 girl, my wife and I, who was my girlfriend at the time when we were in high school, I remember it was a Christmas before we graduated. She invited me to her uh her aunt's house, um, who I always looked up to. Um, they were well off, but they were so humble. And they just always, I don't know, they just they just care for me. I don't know why, um, but they just they just care for me. And uh, my wife comes from a pretty well off. They, she comes from a pretty good family. You know, they well off, and um, they pretty together. Um, and I was in awe of just going to their house at the time. And um, Uncle Derwin, I remember sitting in the living room with him and looking up on the wall, and I saw this college degree. That was the first time I ever saw a college degree, and I was like 17 years old. And I was like, yo, one day. I'm going to get one of those. I don't know how, but I'm going to figure it out. And it's crazy because now I got like a bunch of those. Better than um, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bunch of those. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's crazy because like when I look back on it, it's just wild how those things were the things that fascinated me. You know, um, it's, just, it's it's wild, man. But those 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 groups of people... And they still, like, I still talk to those people regularly. Um, They still take care of me. You know, they support everything that I'm doing. They always calling my phone, fussing at me when I get things wrong. Um, And they in my corner, man. But at every step of the way, there were people who were really my champions. Richard Engel is now a movie star in in L.A. Um, And I almost got to catch up with him when I was up there. Um, for the Kelly Clarkson um, show, but he was he he and I couldn't match up our uh, schedules. But it's just crazy how um, there's like so many people, man, who were just really 
they saw it, bro. They saw it. Um, Rachel Coway, who was a chief warrant officer, a female chief warrant officer, which is that's pretty rare in, in the Navy or in the military period. That's like that you're a boss. When you're a female chief warrant officer, you didn't like did something amazing. And uh, I remember I used to drive back and forth from Baton Rouge to Pensacola um, when I was in undergrad because I was still in the military at the same time. And uh, I used to be like, chief, like, listen, I know we're supposed to be doing work right now, but I need to study. I got this organic chemistry final. Blah, blah. She'd be like, all right, go do what you got to do. I'm going to take care of the rest. You know, you're good. I got you. You know, or come back and do your work later. Handle your business, but make sure that you succeed. And she just believed in me, man. I used to roll up in there and be like, yo, I'm going to be a doctor one day. <laughs> and they'd be like, a double, be a, double, a double doctor. <laughs> yeah. Back then. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. And this one last story, bro. I, I, so I was a security guard. So when I was an undergrad, I was re I, I remodeled my own house. I was doing research. I was in undergrad. I had a newborn baby. I was working a full time job at the Baton Rouge at Baton Rouge General Hospital as a security guard, and I was still in the military all at the same time. It was crazy. I wasn't sleeping, like. <laughs> but so let's check this out. So I was a security guard at Baton Rouge General Hospital, and Baton Rouge General Hospital has this ramp in the front of it where all the doctors park. You know, they usually have a fancy parking lot for all the doctors to, you know, show their badge and they. Get I don't know anything the about that. Okay, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> and so these doctors, so they would always have a security guard at the top of the ramp um, to creep to greet the doctors as they came through the doors, right? And so I used to be so fascinated by these doctors passing by. I'm like, yo, I used to ask every last one of them, "Yo, what medical school did you go to? What medical school did you go to?" Because I thought that was the biggest thing, right? Like, what med school did you go to? Mm -hmm. I remember this one doctor telling me, "Yo, when you become a doctor, no one will ever ask you what med school did you go to." <laughs> 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 it's crazy. Um, but I used to tell them like, yo, I'm gonna be like y'all one day. I'm gonna be like y'all one day. Um, you know, and and it's crazy. And I remember some of the security guards laughing at me. And that's wild because in a month or so, I'm gonna do rotation at the same hospital that I was a security guard at. And those security guards who were laughing at me still work there. <laughs> <laughs> So I can't wait to take a picture with him. <laughs> I just can't. Like, I just can't, man. Like, it, you know, it's just, it's crazy thinking back on it. Um, but it's, 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 it's been an amazing ride, man. It really has. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, everything good that comes your way is, is well-deserved. I, I do want to talk about your organization. You know, I think this is such an important thing and such an important dialogue for us to have. And obviously there's been a lot of publicity about uh, the 15 white coats and you're the, you're the president and the co-founder. Tell us about it. I, I want to dive into that. And, and obviously we'll talk about that, uh, the famous viral photo now, but uh, tell me how that came about and, and where that, the inspiration for that came from. Yeah. So my daughter and I, um, well, one of my best friends, um, Philip Thomas, he and I both went to historically black colleges and universities. Um, he, um, <clears throat> and so he came down to visit me. He's still getting, he's finishing up his PhD. Now we were both in the same lab. Um, both very accomplished scientists. We both were uh, funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We've been doing our thing for a while. But I finished and I was in med school. And he came down to visit me last last summer. And we had made a, a decision that we were going to go to the Whitney Plantation because we had we have this distinct interest in um, in Black history. So we were going to make the trip. But my daughter was in tennis camp um, for the summer. And she wanted to go to tennis camp for the day because that's where she usually goes. You know, she get out there and do her thing. And um, I was like, nah, not today. <laughs> I was like, nah, today you're going to take a trip to the Whitney Plantation. And you're going to start to understand, um, even if it's just a little bit, a little smidgen of some of our history. And so she came um, and we took that trip up there. It's like 45 minutes outside of New Orleans. And um, she... Uh, she was being a, a eight year old. She wasn't really interested. She was fascinated by things that at the time I was like, that's not the important thing. You're missing it. You're not <laughs> understanding what's going on. You know, and I, I'm wanting to be that dad who's fussy and this and that. And 
she's like, nah, dad, this isn't it. And I'm like, just read that, read that, you know, read this, read that. And she's like, dad, I'm just not feeling this is hot, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, she's being an eight year old. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we walked into this enslaved quarter and I let Malia just roam around and do what Malia does, which is just be in her own world sometimes. And, um, we walked out and she had this glaze over her eyes. Like, I was like, uh oh, <laughs> something's wrong. Either you're dehydrated <laughs> or you're tired, <laughs> you're bored, <laughs> or I didn't did something wrong. <laughs> um, or you're hungry. Um, because kids get hungry fast. Um, and so she she just was listening, she was way more attentive. She was just taking the time to like pay attention to things that I was just fussing at about her earlier. It was kind of like I don't know, like maybe the ancestors like woke her up or something. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and so the rest of the, you know, the 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 experience, she just was locked in. And so we got in the car and she was quiet, which is rare. Um, and we probably were like 10, 15 minutes down the road. And she was like, Dad. And I, at the time I was talking to Philip and she was like, uh, I got to tell you something. And I was like, what's up, Malia? And she said, uh. I understand why being a black doctor in America is a big deal. And I was like, really? I was like, I've been trying to tell you. In my mind, I'm like, I've been trying to tell you this forever. And you weren't trying to hear any of it. But she was like, nah, I really get it. She was like, I understand. Um, and I was like, well, tell me what you understand. And she was like, well, think about it. She was like, we just left a plantation. There was a time when people of color couldn't escape and be an accountant or a doctor or a lawyer or anything. They just had to be enslaved, and that was it. And if they didn't, they would die. They would get killed. They would get beat. They'd get put in shackles and all this other crazy stuff. She's like, and look at you all. Like, look at you. She's like, we in the car right now, and I'm riding with two of them. <laughs> you know, she's like, that's that's a lot. And I was like, wow, she got it. I was like, I was like, I was like an eight year old. I was like, she got it. I was like, she, it clicked. It clicked. And she has never been the same ever since like her consideration and her, you know, her desire to learn more about history. And, you know, obviously she's gone back, um, um, you know, uh, again, and she, she has kind of a relationship with them now. Um, but it's just incredible to look at that reflection. And so I turned to Philip and I was like, Yo, Philip, I got an idea. I was like, I think my classmates need to see this. I was like, and not only do they need to see this, I was like, but we need to capture it. I was like, we need to capture how far we've come. And he was like, how are you going to do that? I was like, yo, I'm going to get everybody to come here in all black in their white coats. And we're going to take a photo in front of the slave quarter. And he was like, bro, that's crazy. <laughs> he was like, but it might work. He was like, it's probably going to work. Um, and it'll, it'll do what you think it will do. Um, and, and I remember sending out an email and telling people like, listen, we're going to go here. And the, the subject of the email was to remember how far we've come. Um, Cause as you know, med school is tough. Um, and sometimes you lose sight of why you're doing it. Cause it's so grueling. That's right. Um, and you just, you lose, you lose your identity. You lose your why. You know, you lose so many things. Um, and so that was kind of our moment to not be studying, not be on our phones, um, but to just experience something that we had. We had a shared identity, a shared historical identity, because everybody who was invited was black. Um, we all had this shared identity, um, historical identity, and we were all going there with the same understanding. So, of course, that, that idea of us doing that was controversial for some folks. And there's nothing wrong with that. So people are at different places in their life and different understandings of how, you know, we all have our different views on how the world works. Um, but the folks who agreed to go, um, we went out there and we experienced it, man. And it was different. It was different from the time I went before. Um, I kind of felt like I was floating in the air the entire time. Um, and just having this conversation with my ancestors, just telling me how proud they were of us, um, how you know how much we had just just gotten through, 
to even where we were. Although we hadn't reached the pinnacle of medicine, which is, you know, being a board certified physician of some sort, um, we had made it thus far, you know. Um, and so after it was all over and said and done, and the, and the experience was over, um, we went and took those photos. But just before those photos, the guy who had given us the tour, his name was Ibrahima Sek, um, Dr. Ibrahima Sek. He's a well-renowned uh enslaved enslaved expert he looked at us and he told us um don't neglect this gift that's been given to you um you all need to be a voice for the future um he didn't know what we were doing he didn't know why we were all in the same outfits he didn't know any of that um he just was just talking to us as like we were his kids or something um so we went to take those photos and he, you you look back at those photos and and everybody we all wrote how we felt during that moment but everybody realized what the moment was about everybody knew like they just knew i don't know why i don't know how but when we were taking the photos nobody was like yo this sounds silly this sounds crazy um and and we captured those images of course we shared them with the world um via social media and it did exactly what what I said it would do. In the email that I sent out initially, I told him, I was like, listen, these will be iconic photos. Literally, they will be iconic. They'll go everywhere. The, people will never forget these photos. Um, and they'll make an impact that will last for generations. And uh, although at the time it, it sounded like it was just this crazy idea, um, it was sort of Nostradamus-ish, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And that it, it was, it just felt right. Um, and that gave us an opportunity, that, that notoriety that came from that gave us an opportunity to do something that we couldn't dream up. <laughs> you know, we, we couldn't, we couldn't imagine this. What we're, where we're at now, what we're doing now, we couldn't imagine this. I remember talking to Brooke Baldwin in, on CNN and telling her like, listen, I want to put a hundred thousand posters of this photo in a hundred thousand classrooms. Let me tell you, that's not our biggest problem right now. That's probably the easiest thing we can do right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the easy, like that's low hanging fruit at this point. <laughs> uh, that's like not a big deal. <laughs> we don't have to, you know, uh, that's, not, I mean, now we're to the point to where we're imagining um, paying for um, underrepresented minorities to attend medical school. Um, which is a whole different ball game. Because um, our idea in the long run is, you know, let's say at least take out the financial piece. Because as you know, medical school is expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ridiculously expensive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure we can all attest to how expensive medical school is. Mm -hmm. But what people don't know is how expensive it is to even apply to medical school. Right. You know, it, I remember telling Kelly, I was like, Kelly, you know how much it costs to apply to medical school? I was like, it could cost up to like $10,000 by the time you finish it. By the time you pay for your applications, you travel to 15 or 20 places to hopefully get a slot somewhere. Um, and then if you take into account the socioeconomic history for marginalized communities, and then you put on top of that, yo, hold on, you want to break into this next tax bracket? We're going to put this economic barrier in place to make sure that it's only a few of y'all that actually make it through. Mm -hmm. So... It, it it just felt right for us to be in this position where we could raise money and then use that money to sort of tip the balance in the other direction. If even if it's just a little bit, it's better than none, you know. Um, and so that's where we are now, man. Um, and that's what we're doing now. And I, we couldn't have dreamed this up, bro. I wouldn't even lie to you. This part we couldn't dream up. <laughs> <laughs> where we are now, we couldn't dream this up. Not in a million years. Well, it's, it's, as I said earlier, it's, it's well-deserved. And, you know, I think um, we're, we're going to have a lot of links on our, on the show notes and the, to the, to this podcast about how to contribute to the cause. And, and uh, I just, I'd, I'd love to hear more kind of about where you see the next steps going. You know, I think there's such, there's such power in the imagery. Uh, there's such power in your story. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you're clearly taking every possible opportunity to harness that power and to put it to good use and to 
change the world for the better. Tell me more about how, if you could project this out five years, 10 years, uh, where would you see it going? Yeah. So I, I think in the next five years, we'll probably be able to fully fund our first medical student going to medical school. Um, I think within the next 10 to 15 years, we'll probably be able to build a high school that literally gears minorities to be prepared for undergrad, to be prepared for medical school. Where it's it's like no holds barred getting you prepared for what you need to know, the way you need to know it. And if that if if that's steered right by one I think physicians have to steer that. Mm-hmm. And I think minority physicians have to steer that. Because there are like innuendos and experiences and ways to handle certain situations about biases um, that have to be taught. Somebody has to tell you how to respond to certain situations um, that you would inevitably um, experience. Um, I think we'll generate a larger pool of applicants to go off to medical school and hopefully diversify medicine even more. Um, so that's our long-term goal is hopefully a, a high school. Um, and there, there are multiple places we can feed those high school students into that'll get them ready for medical school. And one that, that comes to mind is Xavier University, which is constantly ranked as one of the top institutions to produce minority physicians, um, minority medical students in the country. Um, and there are a couple others. Um, But I think in the short term, my goal is to generate enough capital to fund a medical student, a medical student, just one um, at the time, if not more, um, fully funded through medical school. You walk out of there debt free. Mm. Um, And now I'm not talking about just your tuition. I'm talking about your living um, so that the only thing you have to genuinely worry about is studying. Um, so that's, that's our first goal in in the next five years. And then in the next 10 years, 10 to 15 years is to have a high school, um, where we're sort of breeding the next generation of, you know, physicians, PAs, nurses, whatever, to help diversify medicine. Because for a long time, we've had this conversation about, we need to diversify medicine. We need to diversify medicine. We need to diversify medicine. Um, and it can't all just be inspiration and having talks. Right. Money has to play a part at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. Because it, the biggest barrier is not capability. The biggest barrier is money. Like nobody nobody wants to talk about this. I mean, you you went to medical school. We don't even like talking about money in medical school. That's right. Nobody yeah. likes to talk about how much does a doctor cost? How much does, you know, medical malpractice insurance cost? We just don't like talking about money anywhere. And the first time you really encounter anything around salary or anything like that, you're a resident. I mean, I talk to fourth years all the time and they're like, Brad, nobody ever sat down with me and talked to me about money. Loan repayment. and Except, yeah, yeah, like it's it's just crazy. So, you know, going through medical, all of us are going through medical school, but only, only to, to be uh, candid, only five of us are on the board um, uh, of the company. Um but everybody's contributing. All 15 of us are contributing. Um, but we are going through it now. And so we see the shortcomings in, in medical education. And not only medical education, but this whole experience of traversing undergrad medical school. And then we'll be going through residency. So we'll have that experience to rely on to try to figure out where did, you know, where, what were we missing? And what if, had we known that, you know, we, we would have been better off. Um, and so I think that education piece about money and also us generating enough capital to alleviate some of that money issue is part of our, our solution as the 15 white coats. Um, that's, that's where we're hanging out. I think the money part is often overlooked and people want to rely on, you know, well, let's have an inspirational talk. I'm tired of talking. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to be candid. I mean, you can have as many inspirational talks as you want. But you you got to do more than just talk. It, it has to be more than just talking. 
there has to be more. Somebody got to put some money where their mouth is. Um, and and I'm always I'm a believer that if I don't do it, then who will? Like <laughs> that's just the way I look at it. I'm not waiting on somebody to come do it for me, you know. Or I'm not. I don't think we're waiting on someone to come do it for us. So we'll, we'll just do it ourselves. And we'll figure it out as we go. You know, we got we got a team of people around us who are supporting us, helping us, educating us, helping us to understand as we stumble through this process of forming a company, you know, hopefully forming a foundation and all these other things. Um, but we're learning as we go. We're giving as we're going. Um, we recently just uh, did a scholarship for um, some high school seniors in Louisiana, Texas. We're also doing Mississippi. And our goal is by the end of the summer to do at least 25 to 50 states um, in terms of giving out not only an autographed 15 White Coast photo, but an Amazon gift card or a Walmart gift card or a backpack with some stuff in it, you know, um, and also our contact information. So you have a, a reliable source that you could just reach out to. Absolutely. So, I think that's such an important part of it too, right? Like to be a part of that network. Yeah. You know, and to understand that you know, to, to the point that we've discussed earlier, you're, you're not the first person to go through this, you know, you're, yeah. you've got people who've, whose experience you can lean on, who's, uh, yeah, who have paved the way, so to speak. I think that that's gotta be powerful for kids as early as high school, you know, looking up to you, looking up to, um, the next steps for them, whether it's undergrad or, uh, the, or the military route that you've gone, but whatever it might be that they, that there are people who have gone ahead of them and, and there yeah. are people who, who prove it can be done and, and who, uh, who are there for them to be a part of that network. I have to imagine is, is, is powerful for the, for the folks that you're reaching out to. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, man. I, 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 I can't tell you enough how important the work is. I mean, truthfully, I, I um, I'd add my voice to the chorus of folks who, uh, who say how important it is. Um, and not, and again, like, as you said, not just words, uh, but, but action and money and yeah. commitment and time, uh, and, uh, you know, and planning and, and kind of a long-term out, outlook on this. I, um, I commend you for that. And, uh, I think it's a powerful story and one that I'm hopeful that a large audience of our listeners here, uh, people from all, from across the country, right. From different, socioeconomic backgrounds across the entire spectrum hear that and understand your experience and understand the experience of, of folks who have gone through similar things um, and uh, and that we understand how beneficial this is to the house of medicine as a whole right I think yeah. this is this is the future of medicine this is what medicine should look like this is moving from a world of what is to a world of, of what it should be um, yeah. and and the leadership role that you've taken in that and that the, the board has taken and that 15 white coats has taken in that is, is, is important. And, uh, you've got a, you've got a friend in the emergency medical minute, that's for sure. Um, and we are, we're privileged to be able to, to spread that word through, through our very small platform here. Um, uh, you know, one, one kind of final question I, I, I would ask you and is, is if you could, if you could reach out through the airwaves to a young person of color, who's listening to this, what, what what would you want them to hear from this? What would what would you want the take home message to be from from our time together today? Um, it's funny as you were talking. That's what I was thinking about. Because <laughs> um, I you know I love I love an opportunity to say something directly to to the young folk. Um, I, I would tell them to go unafraid, man. And um, I'll tell you about this one short experience that'll tell you what that means. So when I was a young child, I remember my mom not having enough money that we, we used to go to Sam's Club. At five o'clock in the afternoons in Lake Charles, Louisiana, Sam's Club would take the food that they couldn't sell anymore and put it into the dumpster in the back of uh, the Sam's Club. And my mom would pull up at around 530 and we would get back there, my sister and I, along with some of my cousins, and we would dig some of that food out. And then we would we would take that food back, and my my grandmother would freeze it so that it would last a little bit longer, especially the bread. Um, we used to pick out the bad strawberries and just eat them, you know, and and throw those away and eat the good ones. And I say that because, as accomplished as I am now, that's what keeps me grounded. That's what keeps me going, to go unafraid, and also to know that if you, if you 
you got to reach out to the right people and hold on to those people, no matter what they look like, um, no matter what background they come from. Some of your biggest advocates sometimes won't look like you, believe it or not. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Um, but just find people who are positive in your life, um, who can help you. If I'm one of those people, reach out to me. Um, my my email address is all over the internet. If you Google me, you can find it, um, russell.leday at gmail.com. Um, or you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Reach out to me. I will personally respond back to you. But go unafraid. Um, because all those bad situations that I went through and that some of you kids are going through right now, they're not in vain. They're going to make you stronger than a whole lot of other people. And believe it or not, life is a competition. And those experiences will make you more resilient. They'll make you um, more insightful. They'll make you more introspective. They'll make you more evaluative of your own life. Um, and you'll, you'll want to sharpen your own tools. You won't be afraid of criticism, um, but don't let it get you down. Your bad situation right now will turn out for good in the future. But you got you to gotta do some work. You got to reach out to the right people and then hold on to those people. Um, you know who the bad people are. Stay away from them if you can. But you can also learn from bad people. Bad people sometimes have good intentions and they'll teach you things that you need to know um, and take the good, um, get rid of the bad, and keep it pushing. But like I said, the, the go in afraid. Don't be afraid. I used to be very afraid of being capable of doing anything. I was too afraid to go to college. Um, and here I am, um, a PhD in molecular oncology, an MD and an MBA. And the first time I ever took out student loans was um, in medical school for living expenses. My medical education is a full ride. Um, so you could go in afraid. That's what I did. And, and I think it'll work. But also reach out. Reach out to people that you admire. You'd be surprised. They're going to respond. Because um, a lot of them haven't forgotten where they came from. I surely did. So you can reach out to me. Um, I'm not too far. I'll FaceTime you, Zoom, whatever you need to do. I'm not too busy. Um, we'll put it on the calendar and we'll make it happen. Um, that's 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 my sense. Thank you, thank you, Russell. I, I you know I I'm struck by the fact that there are people from Lake Charles to D.C. to the Middle East to Southern to NYU, Tulane. There are people who have been privileged to meet you, to know you along the way. Um, and we were fortunate to be able to add our name to that list. Um, you know, I think your testament to being a husband, being a father, uh, being an aspiring physician, a future rock star of a psychiatrist is one, is a story that we are so proud to tell. Um, you know, Mr. Mike was right all those years ago. You are relentless <laughs> and uh, you prove, I'm sure you prove him right more all the time. And and you honor, you know, the sacrifices of people like your mom and your wife and countless others who've who've done that for you along the way. Um, we're we're truly privileged to hear your story. Uh, we're excited to see the next steps. Um, and like I said, you've got a you've got an ally in the emergency medical minute, um, and uh, we'll we'll walk with you uh, with this. And uh, we we can't tell you enough how much we appreciate your time today, Russell. Truthfully, man, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, this was amazing. Thank you for just giving me the platform, bro. This is very candid and literally unfiltered. <laughs> That's right. That's how it's supposed to go. And, uh, yeah. and we appreciate your time. Uh, this is Nick Sippis signing off uh, with uh, Russell Lede, future physician, PhD, and frankly, a hero in our society. We are, we're privileged to have his time. Thank you, Russell. Thank you so much, man. We are on a quest to provide the world with free medical education. Please help us out by rating us on iTunes, following us on social media, and subscribing to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.